Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our worship today. Welcome to Trinity Church in downtown Terraville. Welcome to all of you who are regular members and parishioners at this church. Welcome to those of you who maybe have stumbled onto us uh, in this time of COVID and you found us online. Welcome to those of you who maybe this is your first time finding us. We are very happy that you're here to join us today. A couple of little directions to help you figure out how to, how to make it through the service. Um, if you're on Facebook or on Zoom, there are chat sections. You can get in touch with anybody at any time if you want prayer, if you want uh, the announcements, if you want to just connect with people. If you're on Zoom this morning, we encourage you to stay at when the service ends. Um, that you'll be put in a little, like little fellowship group, and it's a great way to, to see people you haven't seen in a while, or a great way to, uh, to get to know people if you're new. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. And for the church, this is our New Year's Day. Uh, it's the beginning of our church year. So we have a couple of, of fun things built into the service. One of which is that when it comes to red box time, what we're actually gonna do is blessing of the animals. Amanda's gonna tell you more about that later, but I'm giving you a heads up so that if you have to go find your cat from under the bed or bring the, the gerbil, the guinea pig cage in, you know, it gives you, 
it gives you a little heads up that in about five minutes, you're going to want your animals present, OK? The other thing is that whether you're on Facebook or Zoom, um, one of the most important things we think we do during this service is in our time of prayer. So we encourage you to start sending in your prayer requests in whichever chat function you're going to use. Then, a prayer, then when it comes time for prayer, that, that all of those prayers will have been gathered together, they'll be sent to me, and I will pray the prayer out loud that you are already praying, the things that are on your heart. So another thing to give you a heads up on. The third thing is, um, Father Taylor, because um, I'm, I'm Reverend Julie Mudge, and I'm filling in for Father Taylor. Father Taylor often likes to start the service with having us take a moment of quiet to prepare our space. Because this is the first Sunday of Advent, we have a little tradition, many churches have this tradition, it's not just us, of lighting an Advent candle and saying a prayer. So that's what we're going to do now in order to center ourselves and to present ourselves before the Lord. All-powerful God, increase our strength of will for doing good, that Christ may find an eager welcome at his coming and call us to a side in the kingdom of heaven where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So, we will now sing our opening hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. I am going to allow you guys not to unmute yourselves, but please unmute your cameras. And I'm gonna show Julie, I think, can see the gallery view. And so what we're gonna do is everybody, and my puppy has just put himself to bed, hallelujah. Um, so I don't have a pet. But everybody else, bring your animals into view. Hi, Harrison. And um, we will go ahead and pray. Oh, I have a cat, come here. This is the elusive Starbucks, everybody. Hello. All right, so everybody's got their pets nearby. If they are going to be wiggly like mine, then you can just go ahead and pray for them. Mine's back there. So, all right, Julie, it's all you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we know that you blessed the creatures in the stable with the presence of our Lord Jesus. And so we ask that you would bless the animals in our lives we thank you for the comfort and the peace and the love that they bring to their owners. We know that they're part of the family. We ask that you would bless them and help us to remember the animals in the stable and you're coming to us. And because Lord, that stable became a temporary home for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, we also ask you to bless three families who have recently moved into new homes. We ask your blessing upon the Rogers, the Gulatas, and the Parkers, that you would bless their home as you bless all of our homes with your presence. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. And now we will have the reading of the lessons. The first lesson is from the book of Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when kindle, fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds and we did not ex expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourselves, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our inequities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls us on your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our inequity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember inequity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Join me in Psalm 80. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth that you are upon enthroned the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Masath, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the map of your right hand, the Son of Man you have made so strong for yourself. And so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name, Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of the God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are all not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaf, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the gospel of the Lord. Again, good morning. Normally, you know, you'd be in church and I tell you to have a seat and everybody comfortable and maybe I'd tell you a joke, but I'm not really good at jokes. Um, 
So one of the absolute treasures of the Episcopal Anglican tradition of worship is the prayer book. And one of the treasures of our prayer book are the collects. Now, in case you're unfamiliar with that term, collect is simply a, a fancier word for prayer, but not just any prayer. It's a prayer, a written prayer with a specific form and structure. And I'm going to describe it to you, and I'm going to sound a little bit like an English teacher, and I apologize if that causes any trauma. The basic shape of a collect is the address to God, comma, the propositional truth, the truth statement, colon, the prayer request, semicolon, and then we end with a little phrase that's kind of a doxology and amen and period. So the address part to God is, is really pretty evident. Almighty God, comma, Heavenly Father, comma. That's, that's pretty evident. But, you, but um, you may not know what I mean by this propositional truth. It's a statement about God, which we know to be true. It's a truth statement, and we know it's true from Scripture. So we have the propositional truth, and then we have a colon. And then we have the prayer request, but not just any prayer request. It's a prayer request based specifically on the propositional truth. Because we know this about you, God, we ask this. And you know you're at the prayer part because the, the language gives you a clue. It'll grant that we dot, 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 or give us grace to dot, 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 so you know you're there. So as an example, let's look at the opening collect. This is the collect we say at the beginning of every Eucharistic service. It's in your bulletin if you printed it off. It goes like this, Almighty God, comma, then we have the propositional truth. To you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hid. Colon. This tells us what we know about God. God, we know that you know the inner workings of our heart. You know everything that's going on in there, and you know it's not so good. And you know we can't come to worship with this stuff in us. Okay, that's what we know. Colon. Prayer request. Because we know this about you, God, because we know that you know the inner workings of our heart and that we are helpless to do anything about it, we ask you this. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. We're about to come into worship. We ask you to cleanse our thoughts so that we can perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. And we can't do it unless you help us. Semicolon, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you get the idea about the form. Okay, so now we're going to look at the, the collect for the day. Every Sunday, every week, has a special collect dedicated just to that day. And because today is the first Sunday of Advent, we have the special collect that is the collect for the first Sunday of Advent. It's not rocket science. Okay, now I grant that the structure of this particular uh, collect is maybe not as clear as I just described, but all the components are there and we're going to find them. So the opening and closing are pretty clear. Almighty God, comma, and then at the end after the semicolon, through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, that is a standard collect ending. Okay, now normally after the, the um, address to God comma, we would find the propositional statement. But the prayer on the author's heart is so urgent that he just jumps right into it. Give us grace to, and, and then he tells us, give us grace, because it's, it's so urgent that he breaks the rules. And he says, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. And then he goes, oops, I forgot the propositional statement. So like a big parenthesis, he gives us the propositional statement. And then he concludes the prayer request that we may rise to life immortal. So the prayer request is, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light so that we may rise to life eternal. So urgent and so overwhelmed is the author by what's going on in his life that he just has to cry out, give us grace, Lord. And I think it's a wonderful way to start out Advent. The, it's our first prayer of the church year. 
Give us grace as we start this church year. Give us grace to cast away the works of darkness, to put on the armor of light so that we may rise to eternal life. And then he, he tells us, oh yeah, true statement. Got to tell you why I can ask this. And we know two things that he tells us. First, he tells us that Jesus came to us the first time in humility as a baby born in a stable. And the second thing he tells us is that he will come again in majesty and in glory. And this is the heart of Advent, the two comings. And this is where we live. We live between the two comings, the coming of Jesus born as a baby and the second coming in glory. Now, until about 150, 170 years ago, when it suddenly became popular to believe that the last day would be a separate time of period, right before, slash, after, slash, during the last coming, the church otherwise had always understood the last days to be the entirety of the time period between Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven and his second coming in glory and majesty, which means that the church for centuries and you and I live in the last time. And therefore, we can expect there to be a certain amount of tension, darkness, hardship, the gospel passages over the past four weeks and the ones we have today, the words of Jesus warning us about the last day, tells us what time is, what life is going to be like during this time period. But during this time period between the first coming and the second coming, we also live with hope because we know, we know the first coming to be true. We live in the hope and expectation that the second coming is equally true. And this hope anchors our soul. And it helps us to wait in eager anticipation, not in fear of judgment, but in eager anticipation. Now, our psalm today uh, explores the same tension. And I went into explaining all that detail about how the the collects are constructed because, surprisingly, the psalm has a very similar construction, minus the comma and the colon and the semicolon. Now, I am guessing that those of you who took Father Taylor's course on the psalms this fall recognized immediately as we were reading the psalm that it's divided into sections, and at the end of each section was a refrain. So the first section is in essence our address to God and our truth statement wrapped in together. And it tells us two things about God. And these are the truths then that the psalmist is gonna build his prayer request on. It says, you are the shepherd of Israel and you are enthroned upon the cherubim. So he's, how do, He's using language like, you led Joseph. You're the shepherd of Israel. You led Joseph. And you showed your, your might and your glory in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Now, these are three of the tribes of Israel. Benjamin is the younger brother of Joseph. Um, Ephraim and Manasseh are two children born to Joseph in Egypt. So what this does is it plunks us right smack down in the middle of the story of God and his people. It plunks us down in Egypt when the people are crying out, they're slaves and they're suffering and life is hard and they're crying out to God, hear us, come to us, help us. And the psalmist is saying, this is what we know about you, God. We know that you are the God who heard the cry of your people in Egypt. You heard the cry of their suffering when they were slaves in Egypt, and you acted. The second thing that we know, the psalmist says, about God is that God is enthroned upon the cher cherubim. And with those few carefully chosen words, we are suddenly moved to the next part of the story. We've passed through the water, we've been delivered from the Egyptians, and now we're in the wilderness where God is meeting with his people. 
In the wilderness, God gives to Moses a, the, the, the law, the basis of the relationship that God is going to have with his people, Israel. And there's, there's four books in the Bible that describe all of these laws and how, how to worship. And part of what's described is the building of the tabernacle, which was a series of tents and courtyards for worship. This is where the sacrifices would be made, but most importantly, in the inner holy of holies would be the place where God would dwell. And in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant made with acacia wood covered with gold and with a top that had two cherubim facing each other with their wings flapping out behind. And in between the cherubim is the mercy seat. And the mercy seat, God says, that is where I will dwell with my people, on the mercy seat. And this whole arrangement mirrors the arrangement in heaven. So when the psalmist says, we know this about you, God, you are the one enthroned upon the cherubim. What he means is you are in your seat of power. You are in the place of mercy. You're dwelling among us as you are in heaven. And because we know that you're our shepherd and because we know that you're seated in heaven in glory, we know one other thing. We know that you are the one who can restore us. And then we have our refrain. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. So what's the light of your countenance? Well, one other thing that God gave his people in the wilderness. He gave to Aaron, the brother of Moses, Aaron, whom he made high priest, he gave him a blessing. He said, this is the blessing. This is my blessing that I want you to pronounce over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Shine the light of your countenance upon us. It's, it's another way of saying let us see your face. Let us come into your presence and see your face and see your glory. Now, in Isaiah, our first reading today, it talked about the opposite. It talked about when God's people walk in sin, that God will turn his face away from them. That, to me, is the perfect de definition of, of punishment, of hell. But God's blessing for his people is that he will turn his face towards us. He will look upon us with love and favor and mercy. And when he cleanses our hearts and converts our hearts, then we can see his face. And it's that which heals us. Show us, Lord, the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. And then the psalmist moves on to a deeply felt lament. It's the cry of his heart, and it's the cry of God's people because this is a corporate psalm. It's all of the people expressing to God their heartbreak. And in essence, the psalmist is saying, you heard the Israelites when they cried out to you in Egypt. We are in just as much trouble as they are. We are in just as much suffering as they were. Will you hear me now as you heard them? Will you hear me now? Life is really hard right now, God. How does the psalmist put it? How long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbor, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Life is really hard right now, so hard that we are drinking tears, and we are eating tears, and we have nothing left but tears. Will you hear me now, Lord? And then the psalmist, in a sense, answers his own question because he takes us back to our anchor. He takes us back to the refrain. 
shine your face upon us and we shall be saved. It's a declaration of faith. Because even in our heartbreak and hard time, this is the anchor for our soul. Knowing that you are the good shepherd, knowing that you're seated on the mercy seat, knowing you're enthroned in glory, knowing that you alone can come to us and help us. Therefore, we ask you to stir yourself, to hear us, to shine your light upon us, the light of your countenance, to restore us and save us. And then we skip over a section and we jump to the last section of the psalm. And here's where we get to the prayer request. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself, and so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. In a spirit of foresight and prophecy, the psalmist says this, when Israel cried out to you, you sent a man, you sent Moses. Do the same for us. We cry out to you, and we ask you that to come to us in this way, to send us the man, the one at your right hand, the son of man you made strong to act on your behalf. Now, the church has always understood this to refer to Jesus as he often referred to himself as the Son of Man. The psalmist is saying, send the Son of Man. Let your hand be upon him for our salvation so that we can be yours forever, so that we will not turn away from you, so that we will have life. And then we end with our refrain, which is both petition and promise, restore us by the sending of your son. Restore us. By the sending of your son, show us the light of your countenance. By the sending of your son, let us be saved. The psalmist is asking for a revelation of God's glory. Come right into our presence and reveal yourself to us, O Lord God of hosts, because we are broken and unclean. We are heartbroken. We eat and drink tears and humiliation and pain. And there's only one thing that can heal us, and that's if you come and reveal yourself to us. So we ask you to send the one who can convert our hearts. We ask you to send the one who can show us your face and the light of your countenance. Send us the Savior. Send us the Messiah, the psalmist cries. And we say, send us Jesus, your church cry. Born in a humble manger, send us Jesus coming again in glory and majesty. Because only when we see his face will we be restored, will we be saved, will we be healed. This is the cry of the church. It's the cry of God's people. It's the cry of Advent. We are waiting for you. Lord God, and we cry out to you with all our hearts. But we know, we know this about you. We know that you hear the cries of your people and we know that you act. And we know that you hear our prayer in this hard time and we know that you act and we know that you send your spirit upon us to cleanse us and we know that you send us Jesus to give us hope, to help us cast away the works of darkness, to put on the armor of light, to come into your presence and to worship as we wait expectantly. It can be very tempting right now as the days grow darker and it can be tempting as the times seem to get harder and harder. It can be easy to focus on the tears that we eat and the tears that we drink and to feel like we have nothing but tears and that God does not hear us. But that is not the true spirit of Advent, and that is not what our psalm and our scriptures are telling us today. The true spirit of Advent is hope, the certainty of hope, because God has heard the cry of his people. He has acted. He has sent the one he favors, whom he made strong at his right hand, and he sent him in great humility to be born in a stable, and he will send him again in glory and majesty. And this is our true 
and certain hope. It's the anchor for our soul. It's the truth statement that we live our life upon. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Shine the light of your countenance upon us. And we shall be saved. Amen. I invite you to say with me the Nicene Creed. Now, sometimes um, this is part of service that so we just kind of, oh, let's get over this quickly and get to the other good stuff. But the Nicene Creed is a series of truth statements that we know from scripture. These are the truths that anchor our soul. So as we read through the Nicene Creed, let it do just that. Let it anchor your soul in those things that are true. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now we will do the prayers of the people. And this is, um, we still have um, an opportunity and time to to send in your prayer requests on, on the chat function. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. And we pray especially, Lord, for deliverance. We pray for deliverance from the coronavirus pandemic. We pray your hand upon all who are sick, that they would receive your healing touch and your help in time of need. We pray for all of those who are working in hospitals, that you would strengthen and protect them and give them hope that passes and peace that passes understanding that only comes from you. 
we pray for our government we pray for we pray for an ability of, of all sides to come together and to work together for the good of the people we pray that you would help them put aside the rancor and bitterness and divisiveness and to to be able to come together in peace for the good of your people we pray for those who are overwhelmed who are fighting depression who are feeling isolated Lord in the season of Advent when we turn our eyes to you in hope we pray that you would pour out hope upon all the people of this church upon our family our friends our neighbor upon Terraphil upon the world Lord give us grace to look and receive your hope and let that hope break off Lord all of the sadness and the depression we pray for those who are homeless or facing homelessness because they can't pay their bills Lord we just ask that you would protect people from being being displaced and we pray for those who are displaced around the world already we pray especially for the widows and orphans of the world Lord We pray for your loveness, love, kindness, and mercy to fill this country. We pray for the grandparents and the family struggling with isolation. We pray that you would protect our children and surround them with joy. We pray for the health of everyone, especially our congregation and our families. We pray for the musicians in this church. It's a, a great undertaking, Lord, to um, to put together the music for these services we ask that you would bless them with strength and perseverance and we now lift to people to you the people who are especially on our hearts we lift up Kelly and Brendan Julie Stephen Emma and I think it's for Anne who is um, or maybe it's Emma for Anne who has been intubated for eight days with COVID. Lord, we ask your hand would be upon her, that you would bring her safely um, through this, that you would protect her from any, any um, after effects of being intubated. We pray for Skip, Nancy, Larry, Charles, Lori, George. We, George. we pray for the Malley family, for Lizzie. We pray for Gail and the loss of her mom and we lift up all people known to us who have um, who are grieving the loss of a loved one we pray for Judy Beth Diane Roz and Serena and uh, I invite you to lift up to the Lord the names of anybody else who is deeply on your heart at this time Give to the rest, to the departed eternal rest, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Especially, Lord, those, um, those who have recently died uh, and those who are mourning. We pray for all your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. And having lifted up our needs and those of others, Lord, we lift up to you our thanksgivings as well we thank you for this beautiful and sunny day we thank you for the different but joyful holidays that we had I know many of us skyped and zoomed with family members we ask that this holiday season coming up would um, would find us being creative Lord with your creativity as we celebrate your second coming and your first coming hasten O father the coming of thy kingdom and grant that we thy servants who now by faith who now live by faith may with joy behold thy son at his coming in glorious majesty even Jesus Christ our only mediator and Savior 
Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. I could say a brief little quick uh, uh, greeting of peace to those who might be with you. Um, and then now we're supposed to like do announcements, but I don't actually have any announcements. Um, every Friday, the church sends out an email blast. All of the announcements are in there, and there are a lot of them, a lot of stuff going on. Um, so if you um, have not received that, if maybe you're new and, and, and you don't know how to do it, on either Facebook or on Zoom, wherever you are, chat in that you would like to be put on that list. Give, uh, it's uh, perfectly safe. Give the information, and we'll make sure that you get that, that email blast that, that lists all of the announcements and everything that's going on. Okay. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. We'll sing our offertory hymn. Well, I guess, I guess really it's a soloist. We will listen to our offertory hymn. Creator of the stars of night, your people's So with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear 
rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in the word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer you this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take the remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Please join me in the prayer of St. Alphonsus. My God, my Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, Send us out to the work that you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Let us sing our closing song, Even So Come.
And now, dear ones, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.